Thank you for joining us, everybody. This is Guy McPherson of the Nature Bats Last YouTube channel, speaking again with Peter Miller, psychologist from Canada. And at some point, we're going to actually meet. I just know it. This summer, when you, most likely. <laughs> when, you come to, when you come to my neck of the woods. And the question I posed after our conversation two weeks ago was, how do we remain healthy? And I'm talking about emotional and mental health primarily amidst the cognitive dissonance we discussed a couple of weeks ago. How, how does Peter, how, how does my partner Pauline, how do I remain sane in light of this completely screwed up mess of a world we inhabit? Or maybe I should say a society that we inhabit because I wouldn't want to blame every ant and butterfly that came along for all of our societal issues. And so... Peter and, we, Peter and I went back and forth with a couple of email messages, came up with some ideas. And before we start down that path, Peter, will you please tell us about your free BPD course, what BPD means, how people can find it, and so on. Sure, my course, uh, my oh, mental health oh, course. Oh, and thanks for joining me. You bet. <laughs> my, my course, uh, mental health course, is called um, uh, freebpdcourse.com. Um, well, that's the website name anyway. It is for people who are struggling with a very common but highly stigmatized and somewhat unknown uh, disorder called borderline personality disorder. Um, it is uh, based on mm, a lot of my life experience being a clinician and an academic and a human. <clears throat> And it combines some of my life experience with everything I've learned about how to deal with this kind of disorder. Uh, it also includes lots of information from other professionals and uh, tools that you can use to reinforce your learning, like quizzes and flashcards. And um, yes, uh, exercises, things that you can do to actually strengthen your ability to overcome this, this kind of thing. Uh, I guess I would just like to highlight it is one of the it is borderline is one of the most highly stigmatized disorders and it is one of probably the most misunderstood. Uh, people often think, oh, a person with borderline is untreatable. They are uh, impossible to work with. They uh, will um, lie. They will um, they will try to get away with things uh, purposefully. Like they know what they're doing when their brain is um, not working the way in an optimal way. <clears throat> so there's a lot of myths and misconceptions about it. Um, and in the at the the page freebpdcourse.com, you'll also see some links to uh, some additional writing that I've done, some podcasting that I've done in connection with um, the writing, uh, and uh, some recommended literature. From other people like me who are willing to be open and vulnerable about this kind of issue and share themselves with the world so that the world can possibly just be a little bit a better place <laughs> while we're in the midst of um, things like uh, global warming and extinction and related uh, awful things. So there's a actually a lot there. There's actually a link to free 50 free phone apps to help you deal with mental health as well. So that's pretty much, yeah, the summary of that, uh, where and where it's at. I, I'm also making links to my podcasting into the course so you can hear what I have to say about certain portions of certain lessons. Uh, yeah, all there for 100% free. There's a donation option if you like, but um, I'm happy to give it away because my main ambition in life is to destroy borderline personality disorder. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, with the world we're living in, it seems like it. The world likes to reinforce patterns that get this kind of disorder activated, and we can talk more about that. Um, we don't live in a world that is is uh, makes a priority for health and wellness. I think the priority is ignorance and illness. Uh, myself, and this is what I've learned from experience meeting with thousands of people and working in the field for now 12 years. Um, I mean, my conclusions aren't hundred percent firm, but it's where I, it's what I've seen for now, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned 
um, phones. And we were talking about phones before we got on here. You said you have 50, 50 apps for my phone. And we were talking about the horrors of having a cell phone that everybody has now because they're so distracting, because they consume us. So send me those 50 apps. Yeah. <laughs> consumed a little more. So I can help, the apps can help you release your dependence on the phone, maybe. <laughs> right. <Ooh. laughs> well, this is the kind of the conundrum I think that we're in. Like the technology can be useful, helpful. Um, it can help people even to self reflect, maybe. It can help people to understand things and wake up a bit, but it can also be distracting, addictive. Uh, it can be even life destroying, I think, uh, because of the ways we don't nurture parts of our life when we are too much engaged with the technology. So it's this, it's this ongoing, like, how do I use this technology in a way that is actually going to be helpful instead of a hindrance or totally harmful in it? It's, it's, it seems to be that people quite often go towards the harmful side of things without really seeing it for what it is. Of course. Um, once everybody, once essentially everybody had a telephone in their house, then you stood out as being unusual if you didn't have a telephone in your house. Mm -hmm. You don't have a, a car in your garage. You were the weird one. So... Everything that society does reinforces all of us latching on to new technology, no matter what the technology is. I mean, and you have to be a highly aware consumer of this kind of product. Um, if you don't have the awareness and you don't have the understanding to know that a lot of the things that you're going to use have been geared and even they've been programmed, they've been manufactured in a way to enhance the addiction, right? And uh, I think specifically right now, I'm talking about social media. Um, and if you watch a documentary called The Social Dilemma, you will see, I mean, it's just plain as day, how, and people, insiders, people who have actually been part of the development of this technology and software, they say, like point blank, like we made this technology to keep you engaged and to try and increase your engagement, which is just another word for addiction, I think. <laughs> like keep you, keep you scrolling every time you scroll and you get this intermittent reinforcement and which is the worst reinforcement by the way because you never know when you're going to get reinforced it could be five scrolls it could be two scrolls it could be one and suddenly something shows up that really engage that where you're really interested in the dopamine is firing in your brain right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is it's the how slot machines work in the casino it's no, no different really and so you just keep scrolling and scrolling. Ah, and I get I get a hit, and then I have to scroll for ten more. Then I get a hit. Then three more. Then I get a hit. Right. <laughs> yep. so, but we spend a lot more than a dollar for every pull of the handle when we use a phone. Right. <laughs> this is you, you don't have to spend as much. You mean <laughs> uh, you can play the slot machine a lot longer, right? Right. I think, well, know. it returns something that at least is monetarily positive now and then. Mm -hmm. unlike your phone like some of the um the, some of the things that i have um and again like it's not all or nothing i have to say like so social media has maybe helped me a bit here and there like i've i've come across a book that i really is good you know or some other information i might have even found stuff about guy mcpherson on social media initially i can't even recall the first the way that i found out but i mean uh so it's not to it's not all totally bad either so i mean but this is why it's hard for people to kind of break free from it because there's this always this it's it's possible to benefit and it's possible to be harmed from the same thing so like right. how do we get out of this or right. how do we how do we manage it really yeah well it's certainly a question of management we we can't get out of it. I mean, to a certain extent, I suppose we can, but I don't see a lot of people who can get along in the world without a cell phone. I know one, I know one. <laughs> and, and I was the, I held out for the longest of anybody I knew, except for this one person. And it's a real pain in the ass when you want to reach this person. Yeah. It's, it's, 
uh, it's just annoying when you can't send somebody a text message. <laughs> really? That's, well, that's, that's, a, that's what our world has become. We find become, it annoying when we can't send a text message. Well, it's all kind of fast service, fast food. It's like the fast food industry, right? Like we want everything through the drive through kind of thing, <laughs> right? Whether it be communication or food or any other thing, service. Um, There's a good book on the topic called Fast Food Nation. Right. Uh, I guess in the strange, the strange thing, and what I was asking you about before this video is um, how we can normalize or rationalize uh, unhealthy patterns, things that can work to our work towards our our demise, even or the, the destruction of our health, and um, and even how we can be agreeable to things like the destruction of our world. <laughs> which I think, pardon me, I think this honestly extends to. And one of the reasons I was so interested in in, in learning from you in the first place is that, like, of course, this is connected, right? How could it not be connected? Um, we we normalize and and we're compelled to follow certain practices uh, by coming into this life, into this system, things that we ultimately call normal. I'm just going to keep you saying that. Normalizing, normalizing. We just... <laughs> normalize unhealthy stuff uh harmful stuff and say we might even say there's no other way right like right absolutely well i mean if you're in say middle school and all of your friends have a cell phone and you don't have a cell phone mm -hmm. come on i well, mean mm -hmm. it, it's it's not just a peer pressure it's the inability to communicate with everybody else you know so I guess there's no other way. And I've heard parents say this too for things like about Snapchat. They say, well, if I don't let my daughter have Snapchat where you can't really follow up, but you can't follow up with your kids' activities because they the messages get deleted, right, in Snapchat. I have, uh, I have no idea. No. <laughs> this is what I've I've learned. Um, I think messages in Snapchat get deleted. So there's no way you could really know what's happening in your kid's life. And then, but a parent would say, well, I have to let them have it because if they don't have it, then they won't have a social life. Right. right? So I, there we, there's a prime example. We're compelled or so it seems to give in to the mandates of the, the companies who create these products. Like they are basically telling us how to live our lives uh, and we have to do it or our kids won't have a social life. Like listen, <laughs> you, you and I got along just fine, by the way. We when, did. We were, when we were young and there was no such thing as social media right and, and we had a life we had a life within society that was social mm -hmm. we had friends we would interact yeah. with people yeah and occasionally we'd call them on the phone occasionally but mostly we'd actually see them live and in person not on a screen and i count myself supremely lucky actually to be lived to have grown up in that time um, before the iPhone, before 2008, um, so that I could have that experience and not everyone around me had their face glued to a, a rectangle. <laughs> right. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, we were going to ask the question, like, so we can talk about these things. We can point them out in conversations like this. We can say things aren't very good uh, in the way that we manage our lives and our health. Um, things we're doing things that will be harmful to our children. And um, it, of course, it extends to the way we're oblivious, probably about the things that we do in our relationship with the earth or that we uh, agree to go along with what other companies are doing. Big companies with power, we go along with them, right? We buy their products, we uh, enjoy their services, whatever. <clears throat> it, it's really difficult to get along in the world and not buy products from a half a dozen companies. There's a half, a half a dozen companies that own everything now. From television, so we go along with it, right? Yeah, right. I mean, we could. Everybody would could boycott. That could last they? Is, that's a good question. Could they? Um, could they bring themselves to that? But so, so we talk about this. We bring up these points. We highlight things for a brief moment in these conversations, but then. Does it actually lead to a larger self-reflection? So uh, one or two viewers could self-reflect, oh, this is what's actually happening. 
And this is how these things, these ways that we live affect our health. But what about the larger community? Like, what is the possibility of having a larger community say, this is what is actually happening by and large with the way that we, the products we consume and the way we live our lives, like we are harmful, <laughs> right? To uh, not only to ourselves individually, but to our children by the things that we let them do. Uh, and we rationalize that we're, um, that we need to let them do these things because this is the world they're growing up in, right? There's, there's all kinds of ways to rationalize toxic living. And I think humans are probably the best <laughs> probably doing that. Right? You, you know, the, the, among the first courses I taught in college was a course called Fundamentals of Ecology. And it had 400 students. It's really difficult to engage as an individual human being with each of 400 students. Right. And so, and, and also it's too high an expectation to not only have me engage with that person, but to even know what they're learning. 400 students over the course of a semester, I come to the end of the semester. I don't know if they know anything more than when we started. Mm -hmm. So I learned early on that my standard has to be, did I help one or a few people in the semester? Did I get across a, a key idea or two to only a handful of people? Oh, and when, you know, that was 400 people. We're talking about more than 8 billion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's no way we're going to positively influence 8 billion people. We just, we don't have access. We don't of have course, yeah. And beyond that, to to encourage large numbers of people to reflect on this word self-reflection is big too. I'm gonna to say that in addition to normalization. <laughs> self-reflection, self-reflection, like to be able to look back on yourself or look back on the society or look back on the group and say, What are our actions or our collective actions doing? And are they in our best interest? And there seems to be a strong resistance or even an inability to reflect, to self-reflect. Uh, 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 it's not, I guess that there's no, there's no dopamine in it, right? So it's almost like a person saying there's no money in it, right? There's no money in right. self-reflection. There's no dopamine in self-reflection. So why would I want to do that, right? Uh, it could save your life honestly, but you're not going to get any immediate dopamine out of it. Right. Uh, in, yeah. in his book, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences, Howard Gardner describes different kinds of intelligence and, and indicates that in the public school system in this country and probably in the rest of the world, we focus on two, mathematical, logical, and linguistics. And in this country, linguistics is re restricted to one, and that's English. And it's not even the good English, which has the extra U's and other letters in it. <laughs> it's this bastardized version of English that is unlike English everywhere else it's written and spoken in the world. And one of the things he points out is intrapersonal intelligence. That is, how do, how do we think about ourselves within the society, within the universe. And he points out that in public schools, nobody ever thinks about that. Nobody ever, ha ever has an exercise, say in 10th grade, where they write down their ideas about how they fit into the universe and what their role in life is actually supposed to be. Nobody talks about that. Are you kidding? Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons we find ourselves in this societal dumpster fire is that nobody has been asking students to think to think critically to think critically about their place in the universe forever for no, more than 100 no. years i think this is society is more about uh, obedience is the word the first word that comes to mind uh 
obedience and uh, carrying on tradition, uh, no matter how senseless it might be or counterproductive. Um, like the first, I was saying this to you too, the first time that I really was challenged to use my critical faculties was when I went into my bachelor degree in psychology in college. And I, for the first time, I had some teachers kind of saying to me, you need to step it up. You need to learn how to critically evaluate information. And, um, and not only just any old information, but like with good sources, peer reviewed sources, the books in the library, right? Stuff like that. Um, but actually to be able to compare conflicting ideas to challenge a lot of my beliefs and my uh, assumptions about life. I once had a, I had a teacher once and I talked to him. I said, your class, it's, it's like I'm a piece of glass and you're the hammer and you're breaking me. <laughs> right? And I'm shattered into all these pieces and I need to bring the pieces back together in a new formation because uh, that's, that's, that's the true challenge I think of, of, um, uh, digging into information, being an academic, just being critical, right? Like, and how many, I guess, how many professions really demand that, that, that to activate that part of the brain, I it'd probably be the prefrontal cortex, really activate the executive functioning prefrontal <laughs> and get it looking at things critically uh, did, so rather did, than. <laughs> did your instructor tell you to go find somebody else for that part of your life to put the pieces back together again? I can't remember what he, I think he just kind of laughed about it, like, kind of like, oh, my, this is the, uh, this is the honest experience of some of my students, right, where they're, they're almost mildly traumatized <laughs> by, right. <laughs> by oh, the my. experience. Yeah, I mean, but I think it was really good, actually, in the end, because I was able to um, not just take practice, not taking everything at just face value. Which is another thing that we do in this kind of like this uh, very shallow information um, scene that we're in with social media. Everything is kind of like surface value. It could be fake, and you buy into it because it sounds right or it feels right. Or if it's on the, if it's in the news or on social media, it must be the right. It must be true. Hey, if right? it happened on Facebook, it's true. <laughs> right. Or if it showed that... up in Google, if it showed up in Google, it's true. Right. Yeah. I see that sort of sentiment expressed all the time. Uh, people, people I know who definitely should know better write to me and tell me, you quoted so-and-so, but actually it was somebody else who said that. I go, yeah, that's what the internet says. And I've, I'm, I'm even practicing catching myself because like uh, something will show up about something in, a, in the realm of conspiracy and I'll be, I'll be apt to want to believe it, right? <clears throat> and I have to really kind of go stop, step back, you know, look, do some, do a bit of research on the internet to see if there's any conflicting ideas, like, you know, like slow down. Right. Uh, don't just assume that it's the truth right away. Like this, but like we live in a rushed world, right? A rushed frenzied world. People are, they are literally in a rat race trying to make it. I think in many cases, and so the time just isn't taken to uh, to slow down, which is important for evaluating information and important for taking care of your mental health. If you can't slow down, you're in a lot of trouble, I think. Yeah, the motto of this civilization is must go faster. <laughs> or yeah, you have to beat your competitor, right? It's always, it's this competition right. model. Right. So you have to be you have to be beating your competitor, or otherwise you're going to become obsolete. Is that the idea? Yeah. The, um, the sub the subhead is must have more. Must go, go faster, faster. Must have more. Must have more. That's right. that's everything I've heard since I was a kid. And I guess my question is, and we're just self reflecting here as a pair, but like, how is this good for us? How how is it good for the human body, the human mind? How is it good for Earth? To must go faster, must have more. Uh, Obviously, it's not. <laughs> it couldn't possibly be. Right? Because look at how everything is disintegrating in the world around you. Not just the natural world. Not just every shopping mall imploding up upon itself. The natural world, 
society, everything. Everything is falling apart at the seams. The economy is falling apart. You, you go into any town that's been around for a hundred years, say, and there's no longer a center to the town. It's imploding. It's all falling right. apart. And that's because what we value in this society is not family-owned businesses that that are in downtown buildings. Mm -hmm. Those don't last mm -hmm. long. Give me the, corp the corporate stuff. giants monopolize basically yeah. eventually, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so, I think I started by asking this question: How do we remain healthy, especially mentally healthy, amidst the cognitive dissonance we talked about a couple of weeks ago? How do we actually remain sane? And I wanted to respond with some ideas of a few ideas that I try to practice, mostly unsuccessfully. <laughs> and and I welcome your thoughts too. Mm -hmm. For me, at least, getting into the natural world by hiking, walking, picnicking, that sort of time, that, that sort of time in the world instead of in front of my screen is really useful for me. Mm -hmm. Spending time mm -hmm. with friends. Yeah, I know there's only seven of you out there, but still. <laughs> Maybe that's why it's especially important to spend time with friends. Being kind to others, pursuing our best lives, whatever that means, doing what we can to help other people, letting go of what we can't change in the spirit of Seneca, the founder of modern Stoicism, letting go of, we, of what we cannot change and working to change the things that we can that, that actually might have some influence, some positive impact on some individual's lives. That's mm -hmm. all I got. Uh, a handful of things that we can do to improve our own lives. Interestingly, there's a friend who stopped by yesterday. We hadn't seen him for a couple of years. And he was on his way to seeing a friend. He lives in Maine, and he was going to see a friend in upstate New York. And he asked the same question. How do we remain healthy amidst the cognitive dissonance we discussed a couple of weeks ago? We haven't seen him mm -hmm. for almost two years. He drops by, and he just wants to ponder that question with us. Mm -hmm. How do, in other words, how do we get along in the world when everything we see in the world is, or almost everything, is negative? The, the world is crumbling. Things are falling apart at the level of the economy, the level of society, the level of the natural world. You don't have to look far to understand that. This is, this is not the world you and I were born into. It has changed profoundly in a human lifetime. It has. Um, I was just writing a few things down and trying to reflect and uh, and uh, summarize a little. Like what the, some of the things you were saying, being out in nature, being with the true friends, um, doing other uh, activities uh, that are... Um, I guess kind of soup for the soul kind of thing. <clears throat> I wrote down real connection, real yeah. connection. Um, Cause I think in the way that we are being compelled to live, it is largely false connection, like social media, being on social media, giving likes and responding to things. I think that is entirely false connection uh, or, or you could call it pseudo connection, right? Like you think you're connected, but you're not. Actually, you're empty after engaging in that. You have, you're not filled. You're right. empty, right? And um, I, I, I'm also apt to say religion is false connection, but people will probably debate debate me till the end of the earth. There, um, I think it's I, I think you end up being empty, but and it's a false sense of filling in that in that uh, any any religion. Um, uh, false joys through money, through status, um, through upholding an image. <clears throat> These are things that I think the society will, wants us to believe are, are the most important things. Uh, like you have to have a, a good uh, a social profile. Your social, your social image, your social status is like the most important thing. If you lose that, then you're going to lose your ability to make money, maybe, right? Uh, or well, there's no question about it. Absolutely, mm -hmm. i i would 
I would bet that every large company and maybe every company checks your social social media profile before they interview you, before they offer you a job. Right? People want to know what's going on. And the mm -hmm. best way to find out what's going on in somebody's life is check their Facebook page or whatever. Right. Um, and it's like, it's. I think it's super easy to get the short-term sense of security. I've talked about this before with you too, uh, that uh, it's a false sense of security uh, or short-term reinforcement or sense of relief that you're okay, everything's okay. You just have to keep going back for more, right? Like, I mean, think about it. Social media, you have to keep going back for more to get some relief that you're acceptable, that you you have some importance. Religion, you have to keep going back for more to keep thinking that you're safe uh, and that you're acceptable to God or whatever. Um, uh, but I I if you don't keep going, you you start to lose that sense of security, right? So it's not like it's becoming ingrained in you. It's not like you can, it's, it's not nourishing independence. It's totally nourishing dependence, <laughs> which again is normalized. Oh, it's normal to be dependent in certain ways. Is right. it? Is it? <laughs> right. And, and do we, and, and this, this notion of living a lie by upholding a false image, uh, we are told that that's normal to do too. If you don't have the right social image, then, you know, you're a nobody or you're unacceptable, I think is the idea. And um, I mean, I conform to some of this too, because I have, I, I, if I don't make an, a living of some kind, then I'm going to be homeless. Uh, I'm not going to be able to support the people I care about. Like, what am I supposed right. to do? It's a total conundrum, right? Like, right. Uh, I can be aware that this, these things are not really good for us, but at the same time, I, I have to sort of follow along. It's like, I have to do, I have to engage in this false, this false connection <laughs> to some, to some, to some level, some extent, right? This false image to some extent. Um, because if I don't do it, the world will reject me by and large, right? Right, um, absolutely. And more people than you might imagine will reject you. Right. If you stand, if you stand up for something and you actually, you know, seriously put your foot down, um, yeah, you're going to, people will be like, well, you're not a safe person to be around. You're dangerous. Uh, if I affiliate with you, people will think that I'm like you and that I'm not... Um, worthy of uh, friendship or companionship or uh, part, whatever, partnering in any way in academics or whatever. Um, yeah, you put your foot down, it might just get squashed. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, I mean, you've, you've learned by hard experience in these ways, I know. Um, and I think I've learned from you, like how far to push this, how far to push this, like this rebellion, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, you can only push it so far before you're, you're you're undermining your existence i think absolutely um <laughs> a long time ago i realized that one of the one of the things that helps hold this whole set of living arrangements together at least in this country is obedience by the masses obedience at home opp oppression abroad we have to destroy lives outside this country and a whole lot of lives in this country too. If we're going to have the things we take for granted, if we're going to have the lights come on when we flip the switch, if we're going to have the groceries at the grocery store when, when we go there. Right. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and and we better behave. Obedience at home is fundamental. If you're a rebel, if you're not getting along, well, we know what happens to those people. Check with Julian Assange. <laughs> well, he's been one of those outstanding ones. He's tried to call a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. He's tried tried to bring light to the darkest things, right? And um, where is he? In prison somewhere? In some hole? I don't know. Where is he? That poor guy. I have no idea. Chelsea mm -hmm. Manning. Same mm -hmm. kind of thing. I mean, there's all these people who have done the right thing. And that's been expensive. Mm hmm. Um, so I guess, you know what, like what psychologists and other mental health people do, we say, 
learn as much as you can about mental health so you can stay as sane as you can possibly stay in this set of living arrangements because this set of living arrangements does not care if you were healthy. In fact, it might even benefit if you were not. So, I mean, probably the most, the safest rebellious thing to do would be to learn how to be healthy, which brings me back to my course. Right. <laughs> right. Like others, there's, but I'm not the only one. There's many like it. And uh, there's other, other very courageous authors. And I, I talk about them in my podcast. If you're interested, I, I love to point out, uh, I love to point out other um, other resources and other people who have been so brave to talk about their life with this um, and um, sort of all the details and all the various ways of understanding what it's like to live with mental health, mental illness, sorry. Um, so that's all available to you at uh, freebpdcourse.com and uh, check out the podcast to the most recent podcast episodes to learn about other individuals who offer really good resources and books and yeah i mean how does that strike you to be the safest way to be a rebel is to figure out how to live in a healthy way to learn the things that you were never introduced to because this society does not make a point of introducing you to important pieces of information skills and understanding it's not going to give it to you you have to look for it yourself right you're not going to get it in school you might get it in college uh, depending on what you're taking, but um, it's sort of like uh, it's withheld information. I think we live we live in this world. The information the, the information you need is there, and the teachers are out there. But you you're not they're not going to be put in your in your face, land in your lap. It's not going to happen. No, they're not going to show up on on the screen of your phone. No, 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 and, no. You'll uh, the and like it or not, we live in a digital world. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think you can stay sane if you can practice self-reflection and you can learn a bunch of a whole host of other mental health, health skills. You can stay sane. Um, so you can be acutely aware of how everything is crumbling. <laughs> well, <laughs> truthfully, I mean, uh, and I guess, I mean, I have to say, too, and we should put this in here as a, as a piece of health even though things continue to crumble, even though there's biodiversity loss uh, and, um, you know, we we're potentially in for some scary things. There's still many ways to enjoy life. Uh, you can be sane enough to have enjoyable relationships. Um, you can see things for what they are to the point that they don't take advantage of you unconsciously, right? This is a critically important point that so many people don't understand. I'm accused every day of causing people to give up on having a decent life. Really? My whole point, since I discovered the idea of abrupt irreversible climate change, is that we ought to live as, the, as though the day is now. Right? Mm -hmm. As if mm -hmm. what we have is a short life. Because relatively speaking, we do. And so how are you going to act if you have a short life? I would I would think, I would wish that you would act with respect towards other people. That and uh, learn the things that learn the things and the practices that will give you uh, the capacity to enjoy life that way, right? Like, uh, yes, uh, uh, it's not like um, kind of just saying yes. Now I'm motivated to live life to the fullest. I mean, you can't live life to the fullest if you're not healthy enough to do so, right? <laughs> you need to be healthy enough to do so. Right. Right. My dad, my dad always said, I'm going to throw this in there. My, my old man, my, my favorite man, Lee, he said, if you don't got your health, you haven't got nothing. He said that to me as a kid. Uh -huh. And it's totally true. And it applies yeah. to mental health as well. It's not just physical health. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, uh, so yeah, hopefully these conversations are bringing out some of the complexities, um, and having people in the gray area where it's like it sucks but it's not all bad you know it is easy to go get sick and be insane in this society but there's also things you can do just to stay sane you know if you right. if you're being pointed in the right direction and so and if, it's, uh, yeah. if it's all relative we're talking about being more sane than you would otherwise would be more sane right. yes yes <laughs> I'm, well it's uh i don't know if you can have complete sanity but you can certainly have um enough Right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs>
let's wrap things right there. And I'll point out that we're going to switch to a once a month conversation from here on out. We've been hammering this nail for quite a long time now. And Peter has given everybody access, free access to abundant information that can improve your lives and the lives of the people around you. So I think that I think that our conversations are very valuable. I hear from people at least twice a week indicating that they're valuable and that they enjoy listening to our conversations. Most people with good reason don't look at our faces. They can distinguish our voices. And so <laughs> they just put us on podcast mode. <laughs> It's interesting. I made a video recently and somehow my, my whole body disappeared because I don't know what I'm doing with these things. Mm -hmm. And I I was expecting all kinds of blowback. Like you didn't, your face never showed. Did you know that you screwed up so badly? Your face didn't even show up. And I was going to tell people that I'm doing them a favor, <laughs> but nobody complained. <laughs> it was amazing. They all knew I was doing them a favor. <laughs> <laughs> More intuitive. <laughs> anyway so we're going to do these once a month instead of once a week and that's going to make my life a lot more difficult by the way but it's okay i'll get along all right well thanks okay. it's been like been a, it's been a slice uh doing this on a regular basis um but we uh i think we're going to be able to make it a little bit more interesting and juicy having a bit of time to think of some new ways to go about this right we can do what we ask other people to do which is to think and reflect Mm -hmm. it takes yes. a bit of time to do that yes okay until next month thank you peter i appreciate it